Do you want a con con or are you against a con con? Do you know what a con con is? Not to be confused with a com con, which I'm told we might have uh, on the broadcast uh, in a week or so. That would be a comedy convention, I think. A con con is a constitutional convention, and it will be your question three on the ballot, and you will have to decide whether you want to convene delegates that are elected, not your representatives, but new ones to come together and try to figure out whether we ought to change some big things here in this state. Gary Sass from Bryant University, former director of revenue in the Kacheri administration, is my guest here. He is an advocate of the CONCON, and he'll tell you why. All righty, we got a lot to do. Oh, by the way, welcome to my state of mind. Hey, I got Rox is behind the, the desk. I figure I just play with her a little bit. Um, actually, I'm just confused. Um, uh, I'm Dan York. This is my state of mind, and I'm watching a tennis match. Anyway, uh, this is not funny, but at least Rhode Island seems to have its act together. So they tell us. Can we trust them? So far, I think I can. This is an interesting development at a LaSalle Academy. All uh, the Gina Romando thing going on there. This is becoming hysterical and almost comical inside the mayor's race in Providence between not the two major candidates, but the Republican and Buddy CNC. What else? I think it is. And then you got, you know, his honor, Mr. Belichick. All right, let's get down to this, and then we'll get to Gary Sass and your state of mind. So much to do, so little time to do it in a half hour's television program. Ebola predictions. Now, look, I think the uh, United States of America's security team better start thinking about how we're screening people coming in from West Africa and beyond. Reportedly, the guy in Dallas that has the Ebola lied when he filled out his paperwork leaving West Africa, and the uh, officials there in Liberia, I believe, are coming down on him and charging him. Anyway, uh, having said that, there's predictions, headline here, that says, you know, we, uh, we could have a case or two or more than that. And Dr. Fine, who hits up the health department, talked to Eyewitness News about our preparedness. We have been expecting some imported cases of Ebola into the United States, um, but we are ready. Probably Rhode Island is the most ready state in the nation. We've been working on this since the summer. Um, our hospitals are ready. Our primary care physicians are ready. Our EMS is ready. Everybody's been looking out, paying attention, and being aware. I'm happy to hear that. I'm glad that they've got this preparedness thing going. You know, we got a very uh, significant Liberian uh, population in this community, and that's a welcome thing, of course. Uh, the one thing I think you got to remember about this Ebola thing, I'm no doctor, but if you catch it early, it is treatable, curable. The problem in West Africa is that there aren't enough resources to be able to catch this thing, and it is deadly when not, and it's an awful, awful, awful experience uh, up until death. And... Uh, I understand why people are panicked about it. I think everyone ought to just you know, bite their lip and uh, let our high-tech medical resources do their work if necessary. It's not, though, that we shouldn't be demanding the kind of proper restrictions, none of which I'm prepared to say I know should happen right here, but we need a better national conversation. There's no doubt about it. All right, let's move on here. Uh, no more notables at LaSalle. This is kind of interesting. All right, follow the bouncing ball if you can. Here's a headline today, the Providence Journal. LaSalle Academy removes all the photos of the notable graduates. I guess they got this kind of wall of fame that had Gina Raimondo's picture on it. And if you'll remember last week after she aggressively pointed out her pro-life, I'm sorry, her pro-choice position while being a Catholic, uh, she caused quite the stir. Let me... Uh, let me uh, point out what the bishop said to me about this today on the radio. Bishop Tobin was talking about her tone. And I think what uh, was stunning to me and to many others around the states, around the diocese, was the very extreme position about abortion that she presented last week and in the rather um, aggressive, angry, almost defiant way in which she expressed it. Well, okay, and so uh, while the bishop has nothing to do with LaSalle and vice versa, uh, the president there first made that decision to take Gina Raimondo's photo off the wall, and then last night the Board of Trustees decided to take everybody's picture down because, remember, Jack Reed 
is on there too. He's a graduate of LaSalle. He is pro-choice. He's your senior senator. And I'm sure this has been an internal combustible type of situation inside LaSalle. He was quoted as saying the following in that newspaper story. He said, we're running a school here. We don't need this kind of distraction. And I believe it's the right decision. Uh, who knows if they'll ever come up with another notable wall again. But it goes to show what kind of conflict and almost don't ask, don't tell disposition that Catholic organizations have with people who advocate for pro-choice positions. And I guess the devil is in the, all pun intended, in the level of advocacy. Uh, hopefully I'll have the bishop on here soon to talk about his point of view. And I'd love to have the LaSalle leadership on as well because it kind of bodes interestingly for every Catholic organization. Uh, it certainly is a tempest in a teapot, no doubt, when it comes to the governor's race. How about the mayor's race? Check this out. I'll quit if you can prove it. This is the, uh, the, the new charge by Dan Harrop, the Republican in the race for mayor. Let me see if I can set the scene here. Pardon me for checking my notes and throwing my glasses on and off so much, but uh, there's, there's a lot to follow here. Okay, once upon a time, a few nights ago, we had a debate at Rhode Island College, and Harrop and Cianci went at it this way. I think as the young people discover that Mr. Cianci has a half-century his history of recurrent, thuggish, criminal behavior, those numbers will change. If you want to hear about Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Harrop's uh, a wonderful statements that he made about me, uh, I commend you to read a book uh, called Health versus wealth. And it was written by Steve Anderson. Go to page 159, I believe, of that book, and you'll find out that Mr. Dr. Harrop was fined, 60, the company he worked with was fined $66,000 for putting profits before patient care. That's what he did. And so this has become a real big deal. So we've been on a Google search, and by the way, buddy, can you get the, if you're going to make a charge in, 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 an, in a debate, could you make it right? It's not health versus wealth. It's health against wealth, HMOs and the breakdown of medical trust. And it's not Steve Anderson. It's George Anders. Oh, well. Well, Harrop is like, what? You know, I didn't, I didn't pay no fine. What do you want? Right? So he puts out this, uh, this uh, 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 well, he was complaining about it to our radio newsroom today. Listen to this. He, he could have attacked my school plan, my right-to-work plan, a variety of plans I had. Instead, three minutes after his supposed apology for prior behavior, which he invokes his dead daughter's name, he begins a slanderous attack against my career. Uh, an equally crass reference there by Dr. Harrop, don't you think? Well, uh, here's, what, here's what Harrop also said in a press release today. He said, if Cianzi can prove a copy of the check that I supposedly wrote to pay this fine, which should be easily available in the state's files, then I will withdraw from the race and endorse him. What Harrop doesn't understand is, Buddy would, that's no incentive for Buddy. Buddy wants you win the race, Dan. You're part of the anybody but Cianzi split vote. Don't you get that? So that was no inducement by any kind. Anyway, a little bit of research, and you find out that there is in page 159 of this book that Cianzi couldn't figure out what the name and who the author was, where you see that a health subsidiary of a health insurance company uh, in 1995 is uh, reported to have... Uh, fired a couple of executives and had to pay a $66,000 fine to the state based on whatever pressure had been enacted on them. And Mr. Harrop is reportedly one of those executives. Now, Mr. Harrop just sent a, an email that I just got on my phone to uh, the media where he says, by the way, uh, the book was a polemic uh, against managed care, contains many errors, and so don't believe it. Did you get all of that? The 2014 mayor's race. Stay tuned. We'll have more tomorrow. Can we take a breather and just say this? It is. I love this time of year. One-game playoffs I don't think are very smart after 162-game seasons, but baseball is alive and well. It's the greatest time of the year. However, don't go to Cincinnati because there's a really P.O.'d guy on his way out to Cincinnati. Did you see this? Yeah, well, we're on to Cincinnati. We're on to Cincinnati. Well, do you think having a 37 We're on to Cincinnati. It's nothing about the past, nothing about the future. It's right now we're preparing for Cincinnati. Okay. We're right. getting ready for Cincinnati. We're getting ready for Cincinnati. We're going to put the best players out there that we, this week, uh, weekend that we can, and we'll see how that plays out.
we're going to put together the best game plan we can, practice it, and go out and execute it against Cincinnati. By the way, I've been to Cincinnati. doesn't take that much preparation. Oh, you mean the football team? What? Piece of work to rip off ESPN. Bill, come on, man. Con Con, next. Stay with us. Yeah, so we got a big question on the Constitutional Convention that comes up this election season. It's just not about candidates. Here's a headline that gives a little consternation to the whole thing. You know, we need debate. The folks who oppose say it's a warning. Let's say, or they're giving a warning. We're going to have a civil rights violation, all that kind of stuff. And we'll, we'll actually get into that in a little bit. Gary Sass is my guest. Good to see you, sir. Always good to see you there. Uh, you're always thorough with your analysis of these matters. Uh, We'll go to what that group says in just a little bit, and I'm sure you'd share some time with them come election season to, to exchange ideas on it. But you think a con con is a good idea because? Because the, we need to restore confidence in government. The legislature has been reluctant to deal with a reform agenda, and now the only way that a reform agenda can be dealt with is to let the people do it directly. And the only option in this state for the people to exercise direct democracy is through a constitutional convention. You know, one of the things, I, as, as you talk, I think about you're so right, by the way. We don't have a culture of direct action on the part of the people. Massachusetts, at least, has you know, a referendum option that can be very powerful, and which, by the way, may upend the entire casino industry mm -hmm. you know, in one fell swoop. Um, they've had some, I mean, Proposition 2 and a half that's controlled property taxes in that, in that state was generated by the same kind of referendum direct question to the people. We, we're locked out of that. I wonder if that specific thing could actually be introduced in a con-con itself. Uh, yeah, of course it could. Uh, you know, back in the 1990s, we didn't need a constitutional convention because the legislature was much more proactive. Four-year terms, separation of powers, judicial nominating commission, they made a number, they put a number of ballot questions uh, before the people to reform the government, and so there was no need for a convention. But the last 10 years, we've slid backward, and the only way that we're going to shake this state up and get people to look at the fundamental laws to create a more efficient, fair government is for the people to make recommendations through a convention. And I'll just <coughs> point out why it really will be a people's convention. In 1986, the last time we had a convention, we had 562 people run for that convention, and it was a broad cross-section. There were politicians in that convention, no question about that, but it really was a broad section of Rhode Islanders. They proposed 14 amendments. Some of them were really garbage, frankly, and the garbage amendments were turned down by the people two to one. Uh, a few were adopted, the Ethics Commission you know, being one. So I really lose patience with people that say they have no faith uh, that people can come together and, and, and decide these issues. And it's not a question of coming together every year and, and second guessing our representative government. People have a chance in this state, constitutionally, to vote every decade as to whether or not they want to hold a convention. They voted in 2004, and they decided against holding a convention. I was against a convention in 2004 for the reasons I just mentioned, because the legislature was doing its job. The legislature hadn't done its job. We have no choice but to have a convention. And remind everybody about process. Every 10 years, we get a chance to talk about it, or think about it, or ask for one. And then when we do, we elect who? Well, we, we, uh, we, we authorize the holding of a convention. Then the legislature comes back, and they establish the uh, election rules for the convention and sometime shortly thereafter we elect 75 delegates to the convention one for each house seat uh, and the legislature will decide whether it's partisan or nonpartisan process last time uh, it was nonpartisan uh, it really opens up the process so th this is the first step and it would happen when well it probably would happen I, I don't know for certain it would probably happen about six months after the legislature uh, Authorized and how long can the legislature play around with this after the... They the, can't. So they, they, come January, when they reconvene after the November thumbs up by the people, within a, by summertime of next year, we'd have one. Yeah, I think so. And well, it can run for how long a period of time? Well, that's the question. You know, it, it, it can run for three weeks or it could run for a year. It depends upon uh, what the convention wants to take up. In 1973, it was a very short convention, very focused convention. Uh, the 86th convention, I think, ran for several, you know, several months and developed 14 amendments. And, and then, I guess and then we vote on them in the next statewide election? In the next November, we, not the, the following November, uh, we vote on, on those articles. Even if there's no, so that would be 2015. I think we would vote on 216 because if the, the convention got going and, and uh, 
that did its work it probably would be on the ballot in, in November of 2016, the uh, amendments. That so it, it would happen on the reg regular election the, cycle? Probably, yes. All right. All right. Well, there you go. There's some of the practical parts of it. We'll come back and talk about the worry about civil rights and see what Gary had to say about that. Stay with us. Our next item up for bid, the Rhode Island State Constitution, which can be bought for short money through a constitutional convention. Across the country, wealthy out-of-state special interests have spent hundreds of millions of dollars influencing local elections. One million dollars, gentlemen in the front. And so this is the, uh, we're good? Are we good? All right, we're good. Uh, that, that is one of the, uh, the ads running, YouTube and everywhere else, against the Constitutional Convention. The AFL-CIO and others do not want to see this Constitutional Convention. They're talking about rights of individuals being stripped. Uh, you've got, you know, is that you? Is that me? Is that me? From the, hey, almost live TV. Watch Gary, watch Gary go for his phone. This is a first. I don't, I don't even know where it is. Uh, just let it ring. Yeah, so, okay. yeah, just let it ring. Uh, it's probably a five ringer anyway. Can you concentrate while it's ringing? Hold on. Do you want me to answer? Hey, Gary's doing a TV show. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought uh, it was It's off. fine. But here's the thing. They are advocating uh, uh, for the protection of rights. You don't have much patience for this, do you? Well, I, you know, it, it's a, it's a smokescreen. It's it, the, the people who are opposed to a convention like the status quo, and so they're saying it'll take away civil rights. There are a couple of things. Who's going to go after gay marriage? Well, let me. There's a couple of things that I don't tell you. Most of the pioneer work on civil rights were state constitutions before they were in federal constitutions, and that goes back a hundred years to giving the women the right to vote. And the other issue is that there, the, the civil rights can't be tampered with by any con state constitutional convention for three reasons. One, the delegates, the people elect the delegates. Two, the people approve or disapprove of what the delegates come up to. And three, there's something called the you, you Bill of Rights in the United States Constitution. And we've seen recently with gender equity issues where state laws and constitutional provisions were thrown out by the courts because it violated the federal constitution. This is a smoke screen, it's a, it's a straw man. Uh, it, people, these poor people are being used by those that want to protect the status quo. Uh, the other thing I'll say is the people on my side, Renew Rhode Island, are willing to sign a pledge that we will work to get delegates elected who, who will not tamper with social issues. And the reason Such is... Such as? Same-sex marriage? Abortion. Abo okay. Those are the two primary ones. Primary. Yeah, there are other, I'm sure there are others, but th those are the, the principal ones. Women's reproductive rights, uh, you know, gender equity. Uh, because there are too many other important issues that need to be addressed to make this government work. Uh, stopping the next 38 studios. Somebody needs to look at the debt provisions in our Constitution and say, we've got to tighten that up so there are no more 38 studios. I don't trust the next administration or future administrations or future legislatures uh, to stop at 38 studios. But if the Constitution makes it clear that you can't do moral obligation bonds, then there won't be another 38 studios. We hear all the time about the governor being weak constitutionally. We could change that. Well, we need to create balance between the executive and legislative branches. Line item veto. 44 states, the government has a line item veto. It stops midnight surprises. It's not a panacea. But you and I have seen too many times where the House Finance Committee at the 11th hour in the middle of the night comes out with a budget amendment or a budget article that's part of the so-called deal. Well, the governor's powerless almost at that point because he has to veto an entire budget, which can have consequences for the state. If he had a line item veto, for example, when they came out with that cockamamie idea uh, to do away with the Board of uh, Regents and the Board of Governors, yeah. the governor could have vetoed it. The rest of the budget could have marched on through. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it, this feels so practical to me to at least lay some of these big changes on the people. Uh, and give the people a chance, as you so properly said in the first segment, to finally have a direct voice in the way we run things. And I'd like to add a referendum option. Now, government by referendum is dangerous, because sometimes the people don't always know because they haven't really been informed. Uh, but I think there ought to be at least some mechanism for, for, for that, a la what happens in Massachusetts, because sometimes government's not that informed, right? Well, and this, is, and, and, and this has another safeguard. A convention can only be held once every 10 years. So you haven't got this constant raising of money for initiatives and referendum every year. Right. 
<coughs> and so this is a very managed way of having direct democracy or having a, a, and it's really important in this state because the, the confidence people have in government is an all-time low. You know, we at Brian did a poll last March. 18 percent, I think it was 14 percent of the people in the state felt that state government was effective. 82 percent felt it wasn't effective. Right. And, 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 and you ask people if we're going in the right direction, the wrong direction, you know what, what the answers are. If you get the community involved, you, have a, you, you elect people to the convention who have the best interest of the state, you deal with line item vetoes, stopping 38 studios, not letting the legislature set their own districts, you win. All right. Uh, come debate the people who don't think you'll win, win before, before November. Oh, we let, we, I have some debates scheduled and I'm looking forward to them. Excellent. Gary Sass. Your state of mind next. Then we'll get the phone. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I think that's the first time the phone's gone off during the show, which is, it's, it's been a whole year and we haven't had a phone go off during the show. I think my phone went off once during the show. Speaking of phones, you can phone the show. Not live, like we do on the radio on WPRO, weekdays noon to three, but on the voicemail. And then Jess gets to howl over some of the things you say, or just in her mischievous way, just edit it all up so that I'm, like, furious. 228-1886. State of mind at MeyerITV.com. Email, Facebook post, Dan York Show. You know how the whole thing is. Tweet, you know, whatever. Let's hear this one. I'm watching Dan York right now. I watched the debate for Buddy Cianci, and I think he did an excellent job. And I'm going to, I'm hoping that he'll get in. He's got my vote. Okay. You can always cheerlead on the voicemail as well. Now, are you part of the 38%? that we know he has, or the 21% undecided? Bernadette, call me back. We'd love to know. All right, we'll see you tomorrow night at 7.30 here on Meyer ITV and at noon on the radio on WPRO. Good night.